Well, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. Man, what a great time of worshiping the Lord. How many of you believe really deep in your heart that in, you know, every high and every low, God never lets go of you? Do you believe that? You got a reason to worship this morning? No matter what, if you're going through victory, He's got you. If you're going through trial, through storm, you're down and low, God is close to the brokenhearted. Right? And, and the sacrifices of God are a, a broken and a contrite heart. These, the Bible says, God will not despise. Those are acceptable offerings. In your brokenness, in your contrition, in your humility, coming to Him, God accepts that sacrifice. So you can worship Him. Even through tears, you can worship him with shouts of exuberant joy. And, and reading through the Psalms, we see all of that, right? So what a great time of worship. I'm already pumped up. Well, like I said, good morning. And if uh, you're visiting, you know, welcome. It's been a while since you've been here. I'm glad to have you with us. If you're watching online, um, God bless you too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to, Keep worshiping Him as we get into His Word. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for this beautiful day. Wow, You're amazing, Lord. We love You. We're so thankful to know You. Lord, um, if we know You, we don't have to fear any evil. We can declare, I will fear no evil for You are with me. I'm so thankful you're with us, that you love us, that you indwell us as your people. Speak to us, Lord, powerfully through your holy word now. Transform us. Help us to be more like you and like your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible with you, you could turn to Revelation chapter 3. We'll be starting in verse 1 together. I've titled the message, The Nominal Church. And today we'll be in Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And so if you're there in your Bibles, follow along and I'll read our text and then we'll dive into it. And so Jesus is speaking. For some of you, uh, the words are written in red in your Bible. <clears throat> Jesus says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. <clears throat> Go back to what you heard and first, or, and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. And yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. <coughs> Excuse me. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. And so... <clears throat> this is the fifth letter that Jesus speaks to the churches in Asia in his revelation to the Apostle John. In speaking to Sardis here in chapter 3, Jesus addresses them as the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. And so in using this title, we're reminded that true Christian life in the church can only be lived in it and experienced in the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
as Paul wrote to the church in Rome about life ruled by the Spirit. And he wrote to them, he said, People who are ruled by their desires think only of themselves. Every, and as I read through this, notice how many times the Apostle Paul uh, refers to the Holy Spirit, and he talks about this idea of either being dead or being alive. <clears throat> and so he says, people who are ruled by their desires think only of themselves. Everyone who is ruled by the Holy Spirit thinks about spiritual things. If our minds are ruled by our desires, we will die. But if our minds are ruled by the Spirit, we will live, we will have life and peace. Our desires fight against God because they do not and cannot obey God's laws. If we follow our desires, we cannot please God. But he says, you, speaking to Christians, are no longer ruled by your desires, but by God's Spirit who lives in you. People who don't have the Spirit of Christ in them, they don't belong to Him. But Christ lives in you. And so you are alive because God has accepted you, even though your bodies must die because of your sins. Yet God raised Jesus to life, and God's Spirit now lives in you, and He will raise you to life by His Spirit. My dear friends, we must not live to satisfy our desires. If you do, you will die. But you will live if, by the help of God's Spirit, you say no to your desires. Only those people who are led by God's Spirit are His children. And so as we start out here, we need to keep in mind that only true life in the church is, is a result of the Holy Spirit within us. It's not something that we bring to the table and we generate on our own. The life that we're talking about is comes according to the Spirit and by the Spirit. In the New King James Version, Jesus tells us that the church in Sardis, in verse 1 of Revelation 3, it says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Maybe they were known as New Life Christian Church of Sardis. That's a good name for a church. At least that's what the logo on all their t-shirts and their caps advertised. New Life Christian Church, Sardis. You see, they had a name that suggested life. They had a reputation for being alive. But Jesus knew that reputation was purely nominal. Meaning existing in name only. That's what nominal means. Existing in name only. We've had a fish fry for four years now at Oasis of Hope Church. But for the first three years, guess what? We didn't actually fry any fish. And this has always made me nervous. And then this year, I finally got the call that I've been dreading all along. Excitedly, a sister in the Lord said to me, Fish fry? Oh boy, what kind of fish are you going to fry? To which I had to ab apologize. I I'm sorry. That's a misnomer. We don't actually fry any fish. We bake it. We grill it, and we smoke it, but none of it is fried. She was so disappointed. You see, our fish fry was nominal. It was in name only. But I'm happy to report that after that phone call, as a church, we all repented 
and deep fried both catfish and cod to the delight of all our guests. And it was delicious. And by the way, that lady, this is, this was the clencher. And she said, when I said, I'm sorry, we actually don't fry any fish. She says, Oh, all those men have died and gone to heaven. And that got me right here. I was like, Oh no. I had to call up our head cook. I was like, Hey, we got a serious issue here. Tell me you know how to fry some fish or we're going to find somebody. And we did. So I want you to know not all the men who knew how to fry fish, and I'm sure women too, have died and gone to heaven. We, there's, they have taught the next generation. We're still here, so God be praised. The Berean literal Bible puts verse 1 in Revelation 3 in a kind of unusual but a, a way that grabs your attention. And Jesus says, to them in this translation. You have the characterization that you're alive and yet you are dead. You see, their identity was no longer actual, but it was fictitious. They were doing business as a living church. That's how they presented themselves. That was their reputation. That was how they were characterized. But their spiritual pulse was barely detectable. They were supposed to be alive. But in reality, they had no true life in the spirit. During one of the great Jewish festivals in Jerusalem, Jesus gave a public invitation to the crowd gathered in the temple. And this is what he said. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John, um, I don't remember if it's John, Matthew, but the gospel writer then makes this notation. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. The Holy Spirit alone is the one who produces fountains of living water within that spring up into everlasting life. As the chorus of the well-known song says, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, opens prison's doors, sets the captives free. i got a river of life. Flowing out of me, right? Spring up, oh well, splish, splash, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, and give to me that life abundantly. Right? We even have a wonderful, it's both a hymn, but it's also been made into a Sunday school song. As a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, I can hardly imagine being part of a dead church like Sardis. I'm sitting here thinking about it. I'm trying to wrap my brain around it. I'm trying to think what that would look like, what that would be like to right now in, in our day and age to be a part of a church like that, as someone who loves the Lord, who's excited to come and gather with his people who are the church. I can't imagine being part of a group of people that nominally claim to be Christian, but are dead as a doornail. It's such a bummer to me to try to think about. In fact, it's the complete antithesis of everything that we've been called to in Christ. In other words, it's the complete opposite. It's the antithesis. In Christ, we're, giving, we're given life, power, and purpose. We're called to continually grow and accomplish good works for God's glory. And Paul described what this life should look like in writing to the church in Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians, right? Which is pretty cool because we've looked at the letter to the church in Ephesus. 
Of course, he wrote this at the very beginning of when that church had started. And he wrote to them and he said, And you, he made alive who were dead in sins and trespasses, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, in other words, Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, every one of us in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, this is what he did. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up together and he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. We're not created to be pew potatoes and spectators to sit in a church building and fall asleep and do nothing on a Sunday morning. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Apart from the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, if you want to talk about and think about the church, us being together as the body of Christ, apart from the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, what are we left with? The nominal church. A New Testament church of Jesus Christ in name only. Wow, I love the name. Don't really love what you've done with the place. There's nothing happening. We end up with the dead church in Sardis. I don't know what that is. Sardines? You know, those who attend, attend the dead church might as well be, right? You peel the can open, there we are dead laying there, apart from the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In other words, the Holy Spirit and all of his ministers, they belong to Jesus Christ. And he commands them and he distributes them and he oversees them and he sends the spirit and he gives us life. He says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you have a reputation, that you're alive but you are dead. And so what do you say to a church that's basically dead? <laughs> Get, alive. Get alive. I like that, right? Jesus is basically here in a little bit. He's going to tell them to get alive, right? Unlike Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira, the ones we've just looked at in the preceding weeks, there's nothing really to commend. You notice he doesn't really commend anything. There's no works of love, service, faith, patience, no holding fast to Jesus' name, no refusal uh, you know, to deny him, though it costs their life, like in the other churches. No standing up against those who claim to be apostles, but they're not. There's no wrestling for the faith that they were entrusted with, contending for it, once in, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Without the Holy Spirit, there were no results of the Spirit to celebrate and commend them for. 
you'll remember Jesus famously, he said to his disciples before he went to the cross the night before up in the upper room, remain in me and I will remain in you. For as a branch, or for our purposes this morning, we could say we could substitute a local church, cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. So you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. I'm the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I'm the vine. And you are the branches. You're the seven churches in Asia. Those who remain in me, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and I in them, they'll produce much fruit. For apart from me, you could do nothing. And just as there was nothing to commend, there was none of these great works, they weren't producing fruit any longer. The church uh, in Sardis, they, they had no heresies that needed correcting either. Because there wasn't even enough life to produce them. See, you actually have to have life to do good or bad. It's kind of funny, in the Old Testament, the Lord is, like in Isaiah, he's mocking the other idols and gods who are not gods. They're just, they're nothing. They're false idols. And he's, you know, the prophet is mocking and he's saying, do something, do good, do bad, do anything, sneeze, cough, jump up and down, raise your voice. Open your eyes. He's like, see, they're nothing. They can't see. They can't hear. They can't speak. They're deaf, dumb, and blind. And all those who follow them become like them. Right? You have to have life to either do good or evil. And so here in this church, this church is almost completely dead. There's nothing to commend, and there's actually nothing even to criticize because they're just laying there almost dead. They can't even do bad. Bible commentator and preacher McLaren writes, It had no immoralities. The gross corruptions of some in Pergamum had no parallel there. Philadelphia had none. It didn't have any of these immoralities or corruptions because it kept close to its Lord. And Sardis is rebuked for none because its evil was deeper and sadder. It wasn't flagrantly corrupt. It's not doing brazen wickedness. It was only dead. You see, it wasn't brazenly evil. It just did nothing. It couldn't even do wrong. Of course, it had no persecutions. Faithful Smyrna had tribulation unto death, hanging like a thundercloud overhead, and Philadelphia, beloved of the Lord, was drawing near its hour of trial. But Sardis had not life enough to be obnoxious. McLaren says they couldn't even just simply be obnoxious. Why should the world trouble itself about a dead church? You think the world cares about a dead church? There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to even argue with, right? It exactly answers the world's purpose and is really only a bit of the world under another name. There's no conflict. It is all summed up in that judgment pronounced by him who knows its works. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. This is the pronouncement of Jesus against the church in Sardis. But the Lord doesn't mean it in its its uh, fullest, complete sense that they're dead. If they were entirely dead, Jesus wouldn't waste his time exhorting them to repentance as he's about to do. He would deliver their eulogy. If someone's laying in the casket, you don't exhort them to do anything. You eulogize them. You don't say, hey, you better... All those chances are gone. And so when Jesus says they're dead, they're not completely, they're like almost there. He's like warning them. 
right? And that's the whole reason he speaks to them because there's still a tiny chance, a little bit of life. It's not a funeral. This is a call to revival, right? You revive that which once had life and still has the opportunity. There's a possibility that it could come back to life. And so, verse 2, that's why he says, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. (coughs) Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, if you don't respond, if you don't repent, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. If someone is coming to you as a thief, they are not your friend. (laughs) Your friends don't come like, you better have your cameras on. You better be watching your ring because when you least suspect it, I will rip you off. I'm coming to you as a thief, right? So Jesus is warning them right now. I'm exhorting you. I'm speaking to you. I'm saying repent. If you don't, I will come as your enemy. The thief is the enemy. And so Jesus is warning them. I will have to come to you in judgment if you don't turn this around, if you don't repent, if you don't correct it. On the evening of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the disciples were gathered together, you remember, behind locked doors because they were afraid of all the Jewish authorities, right? They just put their Lord to death. And then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Here in Revelation 3, Jesus is willing and he's able, and he's wanting to perform CPR on the church in Sardis. He wants to put his lips to their mouth. He's urging them to receive the breath of life that he would breathe into them by the Holy Spirit. The question is, but are they willing and wanting to repent and receive the Lord's resuscitation? And be revived to life again. Once upon a time, we shouldn't forget that Sardis, they had been a vibrant, spirit-filled, spirit-controlled church. In love with Jesus. Connected to the vine. Producing all kinds of good fruit to the glory of God. That's where they got their original name. They had a, But now they had a name that they were still alive. See, they were living on a leftover reputation for being vibrant and relevant to their community. At one time, they had been all of those things. That's what makes it really sad here with Sardis. It's not that they just made this reputation up, right? That they were, it was a false reputation. It was an old, it was a leftover. It was the good old days, the bygone days when they really had people passionate, committed, filled with the Holy Spirit, engaged, doing wonderful things. That's how they got that name. But now, you see, it didn't correspond their, their current condition had no correspondence with, you know, what was going on with with that name. Now, through compromise, through complacency, through allowing the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches to choke the word and cause them to become unfruitful, 
Whatever the case might have been, neglect, sin, compromise, corruption, whatever it was, they were now on the brink of death. And they were laying there basically on the ground with their DNR bracelet with a choice to make. Would they repent and receive the resuscitation of the Holy Spirit or refuse and force the Lord's judgment upon themselves? Do you know any nominal Christians? They're Christians in name only. I'm a Christian. Fellow believers who once were so full of life and joy in the Holy Spirit. But now you look at them and they're dull and they're lifeless. They're totally controlled by their own desires. Doesn't it make you sad? Don't you want to just shake them from their sleep? Grab them and shake them up, wake them up from their apathy. Maybe give them a hard, right? You see, you know, you see the movies are like, cry, wake up. Can you hear me? Please come back to life. And by God's grace, don't you want to breathe life back into them by the power of the Holy Spirit? And if you've ever tried to, how many have experienced stubborn resistance? As they hold up their spiritual do not resuscitate bracelet in your face. They're like, I've read the whole Bible. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't need you preaching to me. Don't resuscitate me. It's like they're warning you off. I don't, I don't want all that church stuff. You know, I've been to church. I know all the stories. I'm good. I'm not dead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're acting like you're preaching to the choir, but I'm going to tell you they're not in the choir. Maybe once upon a time they were in the choir. They're not in the choir. Well, thankfully, not everyone had quenched the spirit in the church in Sardis. The Lord still had a faithful remnant. And the Bible teaches that no matter what, because God is faithful. God says, I will have a remnant. By the Lord's grace alone, he's like, I'm not going to let it, my work, my people die out. Because of my own holiness, I will have a remnant. Verse 4, <coughs> yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have <coughs> excuse me, not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. McLaren comments, the fond fancy, so this fanciful idea that we have in modern Christianity, that the primitive church was a better church than today. You ever heard that? The first church was, they had everything figured out, right? Today, we're, we're way off. We're totally out of it. He says that idea is to utterly blown to pieces by the facts that are obvious in Scripture. Here, in the apostolic time, under the very eye of the fervent apostle of love, who was John, so this is the time of the apostles, this is the original church, and so recently after the establishment of Christianity on the seaboard of Asia was a church. A young church with all the faults of an old, decrepit one. We're talking first century here, guys. And in which Jesus Christ himself could find nothing to commend. We're not talking, well, over 2,000 years. We're talking after like a few decades. and about which he could only say that it had a name to live and was dead. The church at Sardis, they suffered no persecution. It was too much too like the world to be worth the trouble of persecuting. 
It had no heresy. It did not care enough about religion to breed heresies. It was simply utterly apathetic and dead. And yet there was a salt in it, or it would have been rotten as well as dead. Thank God he said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. But at least he didn't say you're stinking rotten. Now, there's dead. There's like freshly dead. And then there's rotten dead. And, and it, it does recall one time when I was in my youth with my cousin out in what we called the meadow out by the lake. And we found a dead cow. And it was not a freshly dead cow. It was a bloated cow. And for some reason, he sharpened up a stick and decided to pop the stomach as a big, foul cloud of gas flew over us along with about a thousand you know, yellow jackets. So it was all bad. So there's dead, and then there's stinking, rotten, bloated, rotting dead, right? But thank God Jesus said... <laughs> That is not where you're out. There, there's still salt. There's still a preservative. There's an element. There's a remnant within you. There's a few names, even in Sardis, which in the midst of all the filth had kept their skirts, their garments white. They had not defiled their garments. And so with beautiful congruity, the promise is given to them. See, they hadn't defiled themselves. And so they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. They will walk with me in white. What a simple but beautiful and profound promise of the future state of the faithful believer. And there's a lot, there's a, <coughs> a lot wrapped up in that imagery. Walking in close communion with Christ in total purity. And it speaks, it speaks of a future that we're not languishing, laying on board out of our minds on clouds, floating, playing the harp, and we don't even play the harp. I'm like, what a bummer. I don't even know. I don't even play any stringed instruments, and I got a harp, and I'm on a cloud by myself. That's just baloney of the world of pop culture. That is not heaven. The Bible speaks of walking with Jesus, the creator of the universe, side by side with him. And if you're walking with them, you're going somewhere. If you're going somewhere, it's like we got places to go, people to see, things to do. That's cool. That's Jesus. That's not we're, we're half half dead up here, you know, bored out of our mind, bored to tears. That's that's a false picture of the world. And we're walking in total the the holiness that we've always wanted and desired our whole life. We've attained it, and we're walking in close communion with Him. It's such a beautiful picture. Verse 5, all who are victorious will be clothed in white. How are we victorious? Simply by placing our faith and trust in Jesus. In the finished work of the cross not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and the renewal, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, right? That's how we're victorious. We're victorious in believing in him and clinging to him, right? That's our job is to cling to him, stay connected to him where all the life comes from. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Do you want Jesus to claim you for his own? For all eternity, for heaven? Claim Jesus and he will claim you. Declare his name. Whoever is not ashamed of the Lord in this world, Jesus said, I won't be ashamed of him before my Father in heaven and before the angels. Right? Stand up for him now, and Jesus, he'll stand up for you, right? 
claimed by the Lord. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. And so this idea of the nominal church, the church of Sardis, which in probably some of your Bibles it says the dead church as the heading. <clears throat> and historically, because as we talked about um, interpreting Revelation, there was an actual church of Sardis, and yet this might describe the church at a period of time in history. And when they apply this to that time period in history, the church of Sardis has been used to describe the church that follows the great movement of God through the Protestant Reformation. There was this great awakening and understanding and putting the Bible into the hands of believers in their own language so that they could know God. And yet following that, sadly, many churches became formal, official state institutions. The state church of whatever country. And most of the state churches endorsed and officially sanctioned are not spirit-filled New Testament churches. They're dead churches. It's not to say that there can't be born-again, spirit-filled believers in those, just like this, a little bit of salt sprinkled in there. But a lot of them are completely dead, lifeless, no move, <laughs> joy, movement of the Holy Spirit, you know, churches. What about Oasis of Hope Church? That's what we need to ask ourselves. That's our name so to speak, right? Are we nominal? Are we in an oasis of hope and name only? Or are we truly an oasis of hope, a place of refreshment for the soul of people thirsting and hungering for God? As long as we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and buried, and resurrected, and returning in power and glory for judgment will remain an oasis of hope. As long as we preach the power and the presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to overcome sin and to bear good, bear good fruit and to grow into the image of Christ, will be more than nominal. We will truly be an oasis of hope. As long as we're going into all the world and making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching the people that we baptize to obey everything that Jesus taught us, write all of his commands to obey them. As long as we're lit, loving God supremely, and others with the same kind of love and care that we show to ourselves. You, you get the idea, right? And so, it's a great challenge to think about, so, you know, you think about whether it's this church or some other church, it has a great name, a great name in the community. They've been a light, they've been a bastion, they've been a place for people to come to. They've been alive and full of vibrancy. But it's a day-by-day -day walk with the Lord. You know, and there's there's no grandchildren in the Lord. There's only children. So it's generation by generation. Right? Because it's been said that the church is only one generation from extinction. In other words, if every one of us refused, you know, to preach the gospel and do all the things we're commanded to do, you know, theoretically, right? The church could die with us if we all clammed up and we all put on our DNR bracelets, don't resuscitate me. Don't bring me any conviction. Don't, you know, and we all quench the spirit. Then who's going to preach the message to the next generation? And so... You know, this is, it's quite a sad picture here 
of this church that had had a name, they had a reputation, they had been vibrant, they had had good works, they had done all these things, but not anymore. And, and it's like if someone's dying, you don't scold them for bad behavior. He, we either give them the 911, you know, emergency treatment or they die. And so there's nothing to, it's a life or death situation. And that's what he's saying. He goes, you guys are on the brink of dying here. But what I want to say to us is that the real dynamic of the church is only in the Holy Spirit himself. We're washed in the blood. We believe in Christ. He gives us his spirit. He indwells us. He empowers us. And are we, are we taking that, you know, seriously? And are we trying to go as deep as we can? Are we using the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome all the evil that is inside of us? And, you know, it's a joy to do that, by the way. It's a privilege to have the power to overcome sin, addictions, you know, all these, all these things, the ways of the world, our own evil flesh. We have that, we have that privilege and we have that power, right? When Christ went to the cross, died and resurrected, he broke the power of sin. He broke the penalty of sin. One day when we're dressed in white and we're walking in those white robes with Jesus, we'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. And that's, that, that alone will make heaven heaven just to be away from every, my sin and everybody else's sin. You know, just my own, your own sin is enough of a torture and, and then to get away from everybody else's? That is, heaven, you know, that's heaven in itself. But the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, that's where the New Testament church is going to get its life. That's where you have a real name. You don't just have a name that you're alive. You are alive. If the Spirit who rose Jesus Christ, resurrected Him from the dead, lives in you and lives in me, He'll give life to us, to our mortal body and to our spirits. And that's the kind of life, right? That, that That's what's exciting. And that's what I see, you know, in this church. That's what we want to promote. That's what we preach. That's what we want to share. There's life. In Jesus, there's power. You can overcome. You can be an overcomer. You don't have to walk around with your tail between your legs or your head down defeated. That defeated Christian, they need, just go back to Jesus. He said, whoever thirsts, come to me and I will give you water. And that water that I give you, it is going to spring up into a well of eternal life. And that he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit coming out of your life like a torrent of water? And if you don't, we read, we read in, uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Sunday school, ask, seek, and knock. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You don't have to crawl on your knees to the top of the Himalayas, you know, or do some, extraordinary thing. What you need to do is humble yourself and ask God and say, please fill me again with your Holy Spirit so that I have power to live a real Christian life like I see in the New Testament, like I see in the book of Acts, like I see Paul lived and the other the, the apostles and great men and women throughout church history. And that's what I want to know. Do you desire the Holy Spirit? Do you desire to have life and power in your Christian life? That will transform you and all those around you where you don't have to fear evil and the, you know, anything. You just, you go forward in the Lord and his power and love people and make a difference. You become an oasis of hope in your family, in your community, in your school, in your workplace, among one another. Do you want to see, do you have a torrent of living water coming out of your life? If it's just a trickle, if you've barely cracked the garden hose, turn it on full blast. Turn that thing on full bore. 
Get a river of life coming out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors. Sets the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. That needs to be your song. Spring up a well. Right? It, within my soul. Spring up a well. Make me whole. Enough to go around. Plenty to keep yourself refreshed. Become a spiritual drinking fountain. To all those around you, become a source of refreshment. Become a blessing. That's what an oasis is. It's a life-saving blessing of refreshment in the desert, in the spiritual wilderness. That's what you are intended to be. You have the treasure of God inside of you. The eternal waters from Jesus Christ. Give to those who are thirsty. They're dying of thirst. Give them a drink from the water, from the river, and say, you can have as much as you want. That's what I want in me. That's what I want in you, to be like that, to be spiritual drinking fountains. I don't want to be nominal. It says drinking fountain, but it's not plugged in. I hit the button. It's got cobwebs on the nozzle. I wouldn't drink out of that thing. If I, you ever been to one of those? You're like, I wouldn't drink out of that, you know, if I was dying of thirst. I might die of hepatitis or something. That is not an oasis of hope. Cobwebs beat up, dented. You're out there playing basketball on the, on the court. You're like, oh, oh, there's a drinking fountain. You're like, bummer. Right? No, be like one of those ones, man, but it's plugged in. It's like 108 outside. You hit the button and it flies up and splashes up, but you don't care. It's ice cold, clean, pure water of refreshment. That's what God wants us to be as the New Testament church. Joseph, if you would come up and close us in worship. Worship team.
as we close, if you want to pray for a fresh touch from God, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, you ask God for the Holy Spirit. He will give you all the Holy Spirit that you need. It's there for the asking, and it's there for the receiving, and simple faith and obedience. And if you've been living a nominal Christian life, or a somewhat nominal Christian life, and you want that fresh power and fresh infilling, don't leave this place. We don't just preach sermons so that we can preach sermons to try to fill a slot you know, a time space or take up space on the cloud or something and upload it to YouTube. We don't care about that. We teach it because we believe it. And we want to experience it and live it. And I want to tell you there's nothing like it when you live in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the reality. There's nothing like it in the world. That's what satisfies the soul. And that's what we need and that's what others need. So I just want to strongly encourage you, the Holy Spirit, the Lord speaking to your heart. I don't care if you've been a Christian for one day or 90 years. If the Lord is speaking to you, you know, now is the time to respond. Let's be that generation, the generation that seeks his face. You know, the God of Jacob. And so, don't leave this place. Don't rush off. Your food will still be there. Your chores will not be problem. But if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll have a great capacity to enjoy okay. and to overcome and to take care of all those things and to be a blessing to them. So let's close in prayer. Holy Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us and the church enough to speak to us the truth. and. There's always there's hope, God. If there's a little bit of life, there's hope in you. You you can fan it back into flame. You can you can stoke the flame forward and, and and get us back to where we need to be. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And uh, Lord, we want to have ears to hear and respond to anything you tell us to. We love you, Lord, and, and thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each of you.